dynamic that we have here is a general agreement that the threat of tariffs might have, have created some leverage with China, but it certainly has had some damage, and some of those tariffs have been followed through on. But the use of tariffs definitely has some collateral damage. So what's the alternative? Where, where do we see the kind of pressure that we think that we want with China to get them to see that we're serious and to know that we're going to follow through that doesn't involve having an escalation of tariffs on both sides? Sure. So uh, it seems, I think we agree, actually, uh, because if, if tariff is a tool to focus the mind, then it has. I think your question, Aaron, is the appropriate question. That, and what do we do with that? I think what we do is, and I also agree that the last administration, the Obama administration, by their own admission, came to a came to a focus on China and a recognition that we've been in a war that we've not been fighting on back on. Uh, too late in the administration to effectively carry it forward. I think what we do is learn lessons from that and learn lessons from history on tariffs, which is to build an international coalition that limits China's access to markets globally in areas where China isn't willing to allow access to its own market. And so I think in the past, We've had dialogues without accountability mechanisms and clarity built into them. And so there, the end goal was discussion. Here, the end goal is, seems to be tariffs. Both are faulty. The ultimate goal is to gain a level playing field, and so we should take the steps that are necessary by being as specific as possible about the level of access we want to the Chinese market and what the repercussions will be if if the multinational community doesn't gain that access. I will say, I, I want to say that I think that with respect to steel and aluminum, um, that the, the tariffs are having uh, some of the intended impact. Um, you are seeing uh, domestic aluminum and steel bad jobs. Um, uh, there have been a number of blast furnaces that are reopening. Um, number of aluminum smelters that are reopening. You're seeing FDI uh, in steel and manuf uh, steel and aluminum facilities, um, but that hadn't happened for a very long time. Uh, in manufacturing, you've seen a couple of strong months of job growth. In fact, it's outpaced uh, the rate of growth in the rest of the private sector, uh, including in metal consuming uh, industries. And so, sure, you can find a lot of anecdotes, like the steel keg maker or what have you, where this is creating a disruption. There is no doubt about it. Um, and and you, should, you should expect that somewhat. But keep in mind that the, the impact of, of the steel tariffs is, is, if you consider all the exclusions so far, uh, steel and aluminum is going to be maybe $6 billion in a $19 trillion economy. Um, and we're sitting on an economy where corporations are getting $1.5 trillion in tax cuts. Uh, we have pretty robust economic growth. And so in a lot of ways, there's never been a better time to fight a trade war. Uh, and this is a very targeted war. This isn't a very broad-based war. Um, but it's a, we, we, have to, we have to use that leverage. And I just think that if we, uh, if, if we have to be willing to walk away from the table if we don't get what we want. Um, I think back to Strauss uh, in the late 70s or something like that. I mean, we need negotiators that are willing to say, this isn't enough of a deal. Um, we'll, we'll see how that plays out maybe this week. Okay, well, uh, real quickly, I'll, I'll bring up a, a, an alternative to tariffs. And again, somewhat of a dirty word sometimes, what is the World Trade Organization? Uh, at the core of the policies, uh, the problems that agriculture has is policies within China of highly distortive internal supports for domestic agricultural producers. And this creates, they're, they're, you know, they've been globally distorting for, for years. And uh, the U.S. has pursued, they, we have two active cases against China on these internal supports, one on internal supports, one on tariff rate quota administration. 
uh, is extremely, and we've been stressing this, extremely important. We fight those battles because those those cases are at the core of our problem. A distortive, uh, you know, domestic policies that are distorting trade. It's a discussion we've had with the Chinese for decades, really. How can you have agricultural policy that both protects farmers but doesn't distort international trade? The U.S. has a long history on this of, of programs that that uh, get after this. That's the type of thing we want to see. And so we want to see, you know, very aggressive, uh, you know, prosecution of these cases in the, within the World Trade Organization. And I think we're getting there, but we're never sure. <coughs> I really, I wanted to mention the WTO as well. I think that it's not talked about enough. It, it seems that the administration doesn't really like the WTO, and while it takes a long time, the fact is that that's the place to go where we can have measures that are global, that we can push countries to make to live up to their commitments that they've made. It's the best place to push on most of these issues, and for those that aren't really covered there, then. That's all the more reason why we should really be talking about what next for the WTO, which I know is also unpopular. But you know, that is, we see now what are the changes since the WTO went into effect, and we need to be more aggressive there as well. Yeah, I would just and the only thing that I would just stress is that the fundamental flaw that I see in how the administration is approaching is a unilateral action, and when you have unilateral tariffs that are imposed. It, it only is going to be effective if you're the sole source supplier. I mean, there's a lot of other countries around the world that can provide the same products, whether it be steel, whether they be aluminum, whether they be soybeans, uh, you know, there's, and even chemicals. And so when you go down this path, it, it you know, becomes clearly evident that the economic costs that we are going to experience as a country are going to far outweigh the marginal increase in investments in the steel and aluminum sector. I mean, we're dwarfing that investment right now in the chemical sector. And we are going, what we're doing is we're going to be the collateral damage of the retaliation, the most competitive sectors. And that's what argues that you have to take this in a more comprehensive, a collaborative approach where you clearly identify what the objective China is clearly not playing, you know, responsibly with intellectual property rights. Well, what is the solutions to that? How do we build that international alliance and advance that? China is clearly inappropriately funding, state funding of some uh, enterprises in some sectors. You know, we've had other examples of that. The WTO doesn't act as quick as we'd like, but you have Boeing that won a pretty big case just yesterday or this last week or something like that. So those mechanisms can work. The other is, you know, this idea that we're going to be most effective in advancing the United States' economic interests by expanding more bilateral agreements, you know, to me, is a short-sighted approach, too. You have to see that the broader benefits by getting more people to play by the rules, including <coughs> China, is going to be enhanced by taking a multilateral, regional, if not WTO, approach to try to advance not only a lower tariffs, but also more disciplined and consistent approach to the responsible rules of trade and including investment. I'm gonna ask one more question of the group before we open up to the audience. So Scott gave some examples of how tariffs have had um, a positive impact in some industries of hiring and that um, more people are being brought online prices presumably are going up along with that as the cost of the tariffs have been imposed. Um, we know, uh, Tom, that you've said some, in some impact on the ag industry, but I wonder if we could talk a little bit more specifically about what happens in your industries if $50 billion, $150 billion, and plus China's response to that happen. What does your industry do in response? Um, Tom, do people, at what point do farmers need to know where their market is for their product for them to start planting and planning ahead for that. Um, how maybe you could talk a little about what does investment in chemicals look like if this starts going forward? Well, if these, you know, if some of the proposed tariffs, you know, actually go into effect, into effect, you know, one of the, you know, the, the results of that is going to be in the chemical sector. If you look at all the major chemical manufacturers globally, they're all multinational. I mean, the, even the U.S. you know chemical manufacturers, the Dow's and now merging with Dupont's, uh, you know the Chevron, Phillips, uh, C.P. Kim, they're all multinational players. And so, if an in, if a retaliatory tariff is going to impose on the U.S. chemicals, uh, 
and uh, being, you know, and, and did being disadvantaged and going into China, it, what's going to happen is it's going to be Dow manufacturing that product, maybe in Singapore, or Exxon Mobil manufacturing in Singapore, or it's going to be that same company that's manufacturing the chemical maybe in Europe. We have BASF that's making huge investments in the U.S., but they're going to, you know, be providing and meeting that market demand <coughs> that is now more competitive solely because of retaliatory tariff. And who is, suffers there? It's the U.S. workers that our companies uh, employ. It's the U.S. suppliers to chemical manufacturers in the United States. And that's why we, you know, that's what we're going to see happen. Right now it hasn't taken, you know, haven't, we haven't seen a meaningful impact on the flow of new investment. Uh, but if you see a withdrawal from NAFTA, if you see uh, you know, a trade war break out, you're going to start seeing significant uh, response in terms of reduced investment in the U.S. <laughs> yeah, it's a great question, and I think we're actually seeing a little bit of this uh, play out in the sorting industry. Uh, a lot of people are wondering about, is this the, the whole trade problem we're having with sorting, you know, Landed um, early February, right when the uh, steel and aluminum tariffs were announced or, or investigations were announced, and so a lot of people are wondering, what are the sorghum farms going to do? Are they going to shift acres? You know, what are, uh, you know, we're very concerned about that. Farmers generally are aware of international markets, but not on a daily basis. I mean, this is something that we talk about every day. We say that happenings in the international market impact farmers every day because they're such a global industry. Everybody eats around the world. We all share that in common. And so um, we thought that there was going to be some real drop in acres uh, in sorghum uh, when this all this controversy was planning, playing out. The uh, preliminary duty was announced. But farmers make decisions more on more local based uh, factors. Weather. You know, Kansas is the biggest uh, sorghum producing state. That, you know, there's a drought in Kansas right now. Sorghum does well in dry climates. Uh, acres, planted acres in Kansas are expected to be up this year. In Texas, they're very, very, very uh, export sensitive. A lot of the Texas crop must be exported immediately because uh, a lot of it's grown down in southern Texas, right next to Corpus Christi. Uh, their acres have gone down. Or they've switched into other crops like, uh, you know, cotton. We're, we're having some issues with cotton with China. Yee. Uh, or going into wheat, where you know there's kind of an oversupply of wheat in, in, in the world, ye. And so the problem is your, your effect is played out into the farm bill in terms of support programs. You know the things that farmers don't want to do. Farmers want to you know uh, plan for the market, not for the sort of paycheck. But all that stuff you start to see play out again, and it, it, you know it's kind of back to the 80s, this time 1980s, but uh, it's a, lot, a lot of people are very worried about that because the 80s were not a very pleasant time for U.S. agriculture. All right, let's open up for questions. So uh, we're going to take questions, remind folks of our weed and ground rules. Uh, please identify yourself, your uh, affiliation, and to ask your question in the form of a question. 